Uh, let's bring in our guest, Jeremy Lafredo, who is just back in New York City. New York, New York City. So nice. They had to name it twice. Are you glad to be back, Jeremy? It feels spectacular to to be back from, from Israel and be out of prison. <laughs> so, so as most of you know, Jeremy Lafredo uh, was in Israel, Palestine, reporting for the Gray Zone, and he arrived on the day that Iran retaliated finally uh, with a massive ballistic missile volley that was directed at military targets. And Jeremy reported on this extremely newsworthy event as virtually every other international journalist there did. And then he was arrested for the crime of journalism. Um, I don't think I need to give any further details except that he was charged with supporting an enemy in wartime, if I'm not incorrect, carries a maximum penalty of life in prison or death, uh, which was extremely disturbing. And now Jeremy's back. This is an, an exclusive. I mean, this is the first time he's talked about what he went through. So Jeremy, um, take us, I guess, from the beginning of what happened, you had done this report for us mm. showing two missile, the location of two missile strikes. Other reporters had done the same. Um, you included coordinates from Google Maps, and then you set out to the West Bank with a group of other reporters and were arrested. So what happened? Sure. So the the plan um, when going to um, Israel and Palestine, this trip was to report on you know um, violence in the Northern West Bank, in Jenin, in Nablus, in Tolkorum. And um, then I got there, as you said, the, the, the day of the missile strike, and it was so newsworthy. Everyone's talking about it in the entire world. So I thought, you know, let me um, file a report that talks about this missile strike, get some news, get some information about this, and then I'll go to um, what I came here to do, which is report in the West Bank. Um, so I filed a report. I, a few days later, I was going to the West Bank. I was at a military checkpoint outside of Nablus, and um, our car was stopped. They asked for our passports. Um, Americans are entirely allowed. It's totally legal for Americans to go to the West Bank, all parts of the West Bank. Um, they asked for my passport. I gave them that. They, I gave them my press credentials. They came back. They said, we're going to need your phone. I said, huh. I'm an American. It's, it's legal for me to be here. I don't understand what's happening. They said intelligence. So like intelligence told them to grab Jeremy Lovredo's phone. So I, I hand them my phone. It's locked. Um, they walk away. And then they tell me to get out of the car. And um, everyone, all the journalists, including me, are sitting now on the ground. And after maybe an hour of sitting on the ground in the sun outside of this military checkpoint in Nablus, um, they point to me. They say, Lafredo, come here. I get up. I say, what's happening? They say, you're being arrested. And they pull out um, maybe 30 feet of um, cloth, and they wrap it around my head, my, my eyes, my ears, and part of my nose. They zip tie my hands, and they shackle my legs. Um, so I can't hear anything that well, and I can't see anything. And I'm perp walked into a military, you know, Humvee, like a military vehicle. Um, it drives for maybe an hour. I don't know where it's going. It stops um, at like some type of field office in the West Bank, like kind of like a tin box. Um, I sit in there for a while and then I'm finally transferred to um, the, um, I guess it's the, the West Bank. They would call the Judea Samaria police compound headquarters. Um, and that's where I'm put in a holding cell and all the other journalists I was with were all let go except me. And I can hear from the holding cell that the office next to me is, I hear my voice. They're playing my gray zone report about the missile strike. Wow. So I'm, I'm wondering what's, what's happening. This is clearly not um, an arrest because I'm just somewhere I'm not supposed to be. This is like highly political and organized. And it's because of, um, you know, a report that I did, I'm assuming. And they finally walk into the holding cell. They say, a lawyer's on the phone for you. I answer the phone and it's a lawyer that some, you know, human rights NGO um, decided to represent me. And um, I answer the phone and they say, Mr. Lafredo, um, I'm a lawyer and um, they're, they're charging you with um, giving information to an enemy during wartime. This is a very grave crime. Please think hard. What did you do? And I'm, you know, I'm dumbfounded. I, I, I can't think of anything I, I, I did that would be considered, you know, treason or terroristic or anything like that. Um, and I talked to this lawyer. They were not able to help me because I couldn't think of anything that I did that could possibly um, 
be to that level of, of crime. Uh, so I hang up with the lawyer. I'm interrogated for maybe 10 minutes about the video. They ask me um, who told me to make the video. Why did you make the video? Why did you include this information in the video? My answer to that is I'm a journalist. Um, and my job is to provide as much context and information to readers and viewers. It's, it's a normal journalistic practice to include as much information as possible. And the interrogation stops and they, um, they give me a new pair of handcuffs and a new pair of shackles. And they drive me to a prison in the Russian compound uh, in Jerusalem, where I was in solitary confinement for a few days and in and out of court. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel like there, there are some details that... Yeah. Good. that you should that that that, that i remember you telling me mm -hmm. um that you might have left out about first of all i mean uh, some of the other journalists who were with you said they were abused had guns drawn on them a palestinian journalist was forced to sit in the sun for two hours and um yeah, yes no, you're, you're entirely correct while we were still at the checkpoint um we were not only blindfolded and shackled and forced to sit in vehicles that were taking arbitrary rides around the West Bank really to like kind of, um, you know, confuse us uh, about what's happening. But um, in the, during the time where they were, where they were asking for our cell phones, one of the journalists I was with refused to give a cell phone and he was grabbed by the neck, drawn out of the car, uh, dragged out of the car and guns were drawn on him as he was pushed against the ground. And this is simply an Israeli citizen, a journalist that was in the car with me. Um, they, they were treating us like they were treating us all, all of us journalists as as we were enemies of the state. Um, but I'm the only one who actually got charged being an enemy of the of the state. But they were, um, other than being blindfolded and thrown into military vehicles, we were physically abused. We were told to sit in the sun. They kept making jokes to us, saying they pointing us and saying, "No, no, no! Vi vitamin D is good for you. Vitamin D is good for you. You love Israel." And they they were <clears throat> kind of taunting us. Um, and uh, it was a, a horrible experience. And that was only the beginning of the saga. So the Russian compound, I know it well, mm -hmm. not from the inside, but I would always pass it. It's where yeah. often Palestinian security prisoners <clears throat> are held and sometimes tortured. You were held in mm -hmm. solitary confinement there. Uh, what was that like? What happened there? Well, in solitary confinement, um, there was probably a, a, a maybe 150 prisoners that were in the jail with me. They were separated from me. They were all Palestinian. I was the only American. I was the only white person from what i could tell it was me and all palestinians and i was held in solitary confinement for um, three days and i was given one cup of chocolate pudding over the course of three days that was all the food i was given and i was given maybe one or two tiny little plastic cups of water during the three days i would ask for more water they would act like they did not hear me um i would ask for water and then they would just say no um I would ask sometimes just the time. I would ask a guard what time it was because I was totally unaware of what time of day it even was. His time was passing in such a strange way in solitary confinement. Um, they would tell me the time and that kind of kept me aware of, of what time it was and maybe like when I have court, when maybe I should go to sleep. Um, and at one point, the embassy apparently sent a social worker to check on me. And I thought that like, this is a great development and someone's gonna The US me. embassy. Yes. Okay. Apparently, and this, this social worker was were they American or Israeli or, or the social worker was Israeli, and the social worker um, introduced themselves. And I thought to myself, like, you know, a, a kind of a sigh of relief, like, okay, this person's at least going to give me water. I, and um, her first question was, "Why did you hurt Israel? You hurt Israel." And I was like, "Oh my, oh oh, this is the person who's here to give to to check on me is is berating me because she's seeing my you know my." Um, my paper outside of my cell that I gave information to the enemy during wartime. So she even, the social worker who was apparently, you know, Israeli, but sent by the um, embassy to check on me is treating me like a terrorist, did not offer me any food, did not offer me any water, only asked why I hurt Israel and if I love Israel. And, and this conversation is happening. Um, she's outside the cell. She's opening the, you know, the steel slide to, to ask me these questions and then she leaves. So that was the only type of, um, care that the embassy gave me. They, they sent me an Israeli to ask me why I hurt Israel. So before we move to the next yeah. stage, so you're, you're in solitary confinement. They're basically yeah. starving you, depriving you of water as they do to Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Did the U S embassy provide you with any other assistance other than that 
social worker who basically interrogated you? No. So the U.S. Embassy did nothing for you at that point. They, they did absolutely nothing. They knew I was an American citizen. They knew I was from New York. Um, they probably knew because they, they are, um, I would assume they can read. They can see that the charges are bogus. And still, they do nothing for me except send me an Israeli to, to interrogate me further and um, call that person a social worker. Um, then you, were you at any point, you know, abused while you were in the Russian compound or, I mean, I, I, I saw a photo of you, they, they put you in front of the Israeli flag and photographed you, which they do to humiliate yes, they, Palestinian prisoners. They, um, they put me in front of the Israeli flag. They put me in front of a, a like a kind of a nationalist flag with a war slogan on it. Together we will win. These, these are all over Israel right now. Um, and they took photos of me, not, not um, official photos with a the camera. They were taking photos, these you know, belligerent, fanatical um, guards and policemen were just taking photos on their iPhone and laughing. Um, it was not for any official purpose. I think that you know, they were sending them into their WhatsApp you know, um, groups and you know, simply just making fun of me. They'd walk past my cell every now and then they'd say, do you love Israel? And I, I wouldn't answer. And then two others would come by and ask me if I love Israel. Um, they weren't, you know, professional in any way. They simply saw me as a, as a terrorist to, to like berate and make fun of as I waited in solitary confinement for my court appearances. But while I was in the Russian compound, you say that's a place where they, you know, it's mostly Palestinians, uh, Palestinians are tortured there. While I'm in solitary confinement, there was a time where I could hear crying and screams of someone who I have no idea what was happening, but it seemed like they were getting physically hurt. Um, you, you would hear cries and screams and something in Arabic, then it would stop, and then it would start up again very, very quickly and very like violently. So I was, I assumed that this person was being, you know, physically harmed in some way in a cell very close to mine, but I couldn't see anything because I was in solitary confinement. And so you were in this cell for three days without, you weren't allowed out at any point except to be taunted and photographed. I wasn't allowed at any point. Um, I, I wasn't allowed out at any point because there was a, there was a toilet in there, so like there was no reason for them to let me out ever. Um, I was in solitary confinement for the, I was, I've never been in prison. I've never been in trouble with the law. This is my first time ever being in trouble with the law. It's Israeli law and I'm put in solitary confinement and treated like an, you know, an enemy of the state. So, uh, then you had some hearings, uh, I guess with two judges, you were allowed out. Mm -hmm. They, um, they open the thing. They allow me to speak to my lawyer for maybe 30 seconds to a minute and a half. And, um, then they walk me with shackles and handcuffs into a courtroom where the entire um, court takes place in um, a language that I don't speak. I don't speak Hebrew. The entire court thing was in Hebrew and I wasn't given a translator. So I'm sitting there, they're talking about me and I can't even advocate for myself or speak to my lawyer because I don't know what they're saying. Um, but the first judge, if I can start talking about what happened in court, the police want me to be detained for seven more days as they try to build their case uh, against me and try to say that I aided um, and gave information to the enemy. And um, they were asked by the judge, you know, what evidence do you have that this person is a threat to Israel and that he needs to continue being detained? And they said the information is top secret. So they weren't even willing to, they weren't willing to tell the judge anything. It didn't seem like they had anything. And I think even the judge knew that like they weren't able to say anything other than that it's top secret and I'm an American and I didn't do anything violent and they're only talking about my public reporting and they're trying to frame that as giving information to an enemy. So the judge said, okay, you, you can have him, we'll keep him for one day, not seven, one. So you can take this one day, you can interrogate him, you can learn more about him and we'll be here again in court tomorrow. And so the police, I, I, was, I went back to solitary confinement and the police did not take advantage of that time and they did not interrogate me more. So like you would assume that if they really thought I was a threat to the state of Israel, that they would take advantage of having me in their custody and ask me questions. They didn't even interrogate me anymore. So we went to court the next day after I spent another night in solitary confinement. And the judge says, what did you learn? Did you learn anything? You had him for one more day. And they say, judge, we didn't, we didn't learn anything new, but we're, we're just, we, we, need, we need him to stay because we want to look through his cell phone and we think he's a, he's a threat to the state of Israel. And um, a man stood up and he was... Um, a journalist from Ynet News, an Israeli um, news organization, and he testified on my behalf 
because I was being accused of aiding and abetting, uh, aiding and giving information to enemy to, to uh, during wartime. And this journalist published all the information I published and embedded my video in his article. And he was only able to publish this article because he went through the military censor and he had a conversation with the military censor of him saying, is this secret? Is this okay to publish? And the military censor says, yes, there's nothing secret in that video. And so he hands his phone and shows this conversation to the judge. The judge looks at it and says, well, if he was able to publish this information and it's not secret, then this, this journalist was able to publish the information without being secret. I don't understand what the problem is. So he said, he, he, he's no longer detained. They, he, he ruled that now this is the second judge that rules against the police in my favor. And the police, after the window closed for them able to, um, to, um, to, um, what would the word be? They appealed it, uh, but they appealed it after the window had closed. So I'm in prison and I'm signing the papers to leave the prison. I'm so excited. I'm leaving solitary confinement. The judge, the judge ruled in my favor. This is great. The, you know, they grab me as I'm signing these papers. They say something in Hebrew. They bring me back to solitary confinement. They don't tell me why. So now I'm, I'm back in solitary confinement, even though the judge said I'm, I'm free to go. So I'm, I'm very confused. They still don't let me talk to a lawyer. I'm in solitary confinement for another night. Um, and because they appealed, my case goes to uh, another court, um, a district court. And um, I go there. I'm, you know, perp walk to a van, thrown in a dark van with shackles and um, handcuffs once again. And I'm brought to court. And this is my final day in court where the judge rules that they have yet to find any information that um, proves that I'm an enemy of the state. Everything that I published looks like, to the judge at least, based on the information that the judge has, looks like nothing was secret because it was published in Israel, in America, tons of times in more detail than me before me. Like there's no, there's no reason for this detainment any longer that the judge ruled this. And so I was let out. Um, but with a caveat of the police keep my passport, my phone and my laptop, they're able to perform a digital strip search of me for the next 10 days, and I'm not allowed to leave the country. And on day 10, they will decide whether or not they want to rearrest me or if I'm, if I'm able to go, if I'm deported. But for this 10 days, I'm able, I, I'm able to leave detainment, but I have to stay in the country, and I, I'm mandated to go to this police compound in the West Bank and be interrogated whenever they ask me to, which they did. I was interrogated several times during these 10 days uh, free. Yeah. <clears throat> so during this this sort of house arrest period yeah. where you're trapped mm -hmm. in what the Palestinian author Emil Habibi referred to as the big prison mm -hmm. after coming out of the, what, the little prison, mm -hmm. uh, you are summoned to a police station in the occupied West Bank, kind yeah. of near the Kalandia checkpoint. Yes, exactly. So what, what happens then? So um, this is a this is the, the police compound, the headquarters of all the police um, in the West Bank, and they asked me to go there. Um, I I show up, and they interrogate me for seven hours. I have water. We take very little breaks. We take one break so the the interrogator can go have a cigarette. I have to stay put, um, and they interrogate me for seven hours on my five minute long video report. It's, it's almost unbelievable. And they asked me questions like, um, they asked me, so you went to uh, college for journalism. You, you went to college for journalism, you took classes, you had professors, you read about it. I said, yes, of course. And they said, so you expect me to believe you never learned the importance of a government censor. I said, well, I mean, in America, we have the first amendment. We really don't have, you know, a formal government censor. Yeah, no, I really didn't learn anything like that. I, I didn't learn anything like that. And um, he asked me this in, you know, five different ways. Every question is asked 10 different ways, trying to, you know, play semantics with me, trying to trip me up on questions. And it's really unfair because the interrogator, the police um, officer is the man who also transcribes the interrogation. So I will say, I will answer a question with yes. And then, you know, I'll, I'll give a giant caveat and whole record my answer as I just said, yes. So he's, he's essentially editing my quotes and trying to build my case using my own words against me live during this interrogation. Um, I see him thinking, backspacing, retyping things while, while I'm speaking. He, he's, you know, he's editing my words in real time 
and this is what's going to be shown to a judge um, if and when they bring me back to court. And um, he asked, they asked me, you know, all these different ways if I know anyone, you know, in a foreign military, and of course I don't. Um, and uh, this lasts for uh, six or seven hours from very early in the morning to like dinner time. And um, finally, so I keep referencing, I might add, I keep referencing this PBS NewsHour video. This PBS NewsHour video was, um, was published by P PBS NewsHour journalists the night of the attacks. This guy was um, in front of where a missile struck outside of the Mossad headquarters. He says, this is a big crater. Behind me is the Mossad headquarters. I'm about this many feet away from the Mossad headquarters. All the information that I had, except way before me, and has way more views than my video did because this went viral, had 3 million views on Twitter. Um, yeah. So they I asked can play me, it right now. Yeah, go ahead. Of course. Um, this is Nick Schifrin from PBS. Yeah. <clears throat> he did this. This report pre preceded Jeremy's report from the same location when Jeremy arrived. The crater had already been filled in as Israel sought to cover it up. So it was unclear what Jeremy's infraction was. In fact, I communicated with Nick Schifrin, and he was very helpful and told me that he did. He does have a government press office card which means that everything he does must clear the military sensor. I've had that card as well. And so this cleared the military sensor. Uh, and here's this brief report from Mossad headquarters. This is the impact site for one of those Iranian ballistic missiles. And if you see the size of this crater, that's about 30 feet deep and maybe 50 feet wide. You can see all the debris around here. And to give you a sense of the targets for these strikes, that white building back there, about 1,500 feet behind me, is the headquarters of the spy agency, the Mossad. So, I mean, if Iran wanted to recalibrate its strikes or something, which came up in your interrogation, mm -hmm. all they have to do is geolocate that. It's not like they need whatever you supplied on Google Maps in your video, which everyone has access to. Mm -hmm. He's showing right where Mossad headquarters is. It's right there. Everyone knows where it is. It's in Google Maps. So, I mean, on so many levels, the case against you was patently absurd. Yeah, it was not only was it public information that you could find on Google, but it was explicitly reported in the same way that I reported it by Israeli media, American media, foreign media. Nothing that I reported was, um, was information that only I had. This yeah. is information that government journalists inside of Israel had and that the whole world had as long as they have Google. So to say that by simply, um, you know, publishing uh, the news is giving the enemy information. I mean, as, as long as the enemy has Google, then every journalist is giving the enemy information. It's just like it's such a, um, a strange way to, to think of journalism. And so that the Israeli police pretended this video by him didn't exist. Um, you know, we put together a dossier mm -hmm. showing that Israeli media was publishing satellite images showing the location precisely of his Iranian missile impacts, which was also more precise than anything you of provided. Course. In my in my video, I I go to you know maybe a half mile, a mile outside of the Nevatim air base where a missile had fallen near a Bedouin village. And so I'm very far away from the base, anything sensitive, far away from anything sensitive. And I'm just talking to people near where a missile fell and I record the missile in the middle of the desert. And Israeli media is publishing satellite images the, from the day after above Nevatim Air Base. You can see the inside of the base. You know, this is so much more um, sensitive information than I had. I was very far from outside the base. So like, you can't help but um, think of that information as like th this was, you know, this was political, and this was because um, the gray zone is very critical of Israel, and this has nothing to do with the actual information in my video. This has uh, to do with the the content of our reporting here at Gray Zone. And so, they were essentially accusing you of being a deep Iranian spy. Is that the sense you got? Yes, that's. I mean, that's the the, the line of questioning was always. Um, do you know anyone in these countries that we, you know, that we don't like, you know, Lebanon, uh, Gaza, Iran, um, like they almost, they, they couldn't, they, they didn't want to believe that, um, that this is just, this is just journalistic inquiry. This is just work. Um, they thought that, you know, clearly 
if you're reporting on this, you must have inside information or friends in places that, in, in countries that we don't like. They, they they didn't even want to admit that I was a journalist until they you know saw that I have you know hundreds of bylines and I've made videos and like I am truly a journalist. I have a press card. Um, they they couldn't they could they could no longer um, try to act like they didn't know I was a journalist. And why would they accuse you of like what, what was their basis for accusing you of any ties to Iran? The gray zone has no connection to Iran or any other government for that matter. So what what was their basis? I mean, just paranoia. If they did, if they did have a basis, they didn't make it clear to me or the court. And like, if you're in court and you're trying to, um, you know, convince the judge that I'm a threat to the state of Israel, any ties that me or the organization I work for has with a foreign government would be the first thing that they bring to to the court. But they didn't bring anything. So it seems like they had absolutely nothing other than, you know, a, a political axe to grind against myself in the gray zone. Well, you know, when you I mean, this is my speculation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I'm going to be backing up this speculation more and more in the coming weeks and months, um, which is that when you Google the gray zone mm -hmm. or look at our, or first of all, our Wikipedia page is a, just a collection of smears, distortions of half truths and lies. And Jimmy Wales, who is the intelligence tied CEO of Wikipedia has uh, come out against us, uh, DM'd people saying he thinks we're a Russian propaganda front. He hates us. Um, he's involved with organizations that are funded by the Pentagon and State Department that have smeared us. Um, but then you have this Washington Post piece by mm -hmm. the obvious CIA asset, Joseph Men, which falsely implies in the sleaziest way possible that we're tied to Iran news site editors, this is ties to Iran, Russia show misinformation's complexity. I mean, it also falsely claims we're tied to Russia. Uh, and one of the, one of the points in this sleazy, libelous, defamatory smear, uh, and I'm not done with the Washington Post here, although we've published several responses and um, extracted a retraction from the Washington Post, which appears at the top of this article, which you can see here. Um, I'm not done with them um, because there are, it, it appears that there are real world consequences that our journalists that contribute to the gray zone are facing as a result of this bogus smear. Um, and the tie to Iran is um, Wyatt Reed, who helps me edit the gray zone, uh, works with me, uh, had publicly, openly done some freelance production work, or like he said so on his Twitter account, done freelance production work years ago for press TV covering Black Lives Matter protests, which had nothing to do with anything we're covering now, and uh, got a pittance for it, according to these hack documents that the Washington Post had, even though why it was public about that. And they cite you having been, when you were starting out your journalistic career, a producer for RT. Although Russia isn't an enemy, uh, considered an enemy of Israel. But I mean, this is what comes up when you look us up. Maybe this was their secret information that they had about you, which led them to keep, hold you hostage and effectively torture you for reporting that other reporters had were, were already doing. Well, do, you, do you have any comments no, yeah, on that? Or? It's, no, it's very likely that, you know, I, maybe that was their like their intelligence their secret intelligence was you know this washington post article but i think even they um knew that the article wouldn't hold any water in court um and that a judge wouldn't consider you know wyatt reed appearing talking about black lives matter on press tv years before he was at the gray zone uh, they, they didn't the judge would not let that fly um so they thought maybe that if they looked through my cell phone and my computer and they interrogate me for hours on end something else a yeah. uh, real substance would come up, um, but that that real substance it does not exist, obviously. And so, you know, three judges in a row uh, ruled that the police don't have anything. But it's very possible that what they did have um, was that Washington Post article, and they thought that um, there was more to the story when there actually wasn't. Yeah, and this uh, sleaze bag 
Mossad asset named Benjamin Weinthal for the Israeli I-24 outlet just mm -hmm. took that article, which contains no evidence, doesn't even claim the gray zone is funded by Russia or Iran, uh, and then produced a headline that said gray zone funded by Iran and Russia. And they didn't produce any evidence beyond his headline. This is a guy who used to be housed at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, which has been publicly identified by Israeli intelligence agents as an Israeli government cutout. So uh, again, it all goes back to the Washington Post. Indeed, democracy dies in darkness. And as it becomes clear that that article is going to have real world consequences mm -hmm. for us, we are going to take action against the Washington Post and everyone should uh, and, and understand how sleazy and dangerous US mainstream media is here. Um, there, there was another instance, and I, I mean, I don't want to get too off track, but one of the journalists, and I don't know if you want to comment on this, I'll mm -hmm. comment on it because I, I waited to comment on it. One of the journalists who is with you, who is detained and mm -hmm. abused at this uh, West Bank, Bank checkpoint, who goes by Andre X, who I guess is a Russian Jewish reporter. Mm -hmm. um, he, he actually was giving me information immediately after you were detained and was, was helpful and I cited his account of being beaten and abused by Israeli soldiers, he then went on to denounce you mm -hmm. uh, under pressure from uh, Russian, his Russian liberal colleagues. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know if you want to uh, address that. I'm, I'm trying to pull up the... Uh, yeah, he, to... he, is a, he is like an anti-Putin activist, liberal activist, was, was yeah. in Russia, and then the war started. And he he's Jewish, and he got his, his his Israeli citizenship, and so he he moved to Israel, and now his audience is a mix of you know Russian liberals and also you know anti-Zionist um, pro-Palestine activists, and so um, when it came out that he was in the car with a gray zone reporter, his entire you know liberal Russian audience you know it was as if he committed treason against them. You know, what are you yeah. doing with the gray zone? Um, they're pro-Russia. They they're Putin puppets. You know, every all, all the propaganda that you hear um, from you know the NAFO trolls on Twitter. Yeah. And um, he prioritized these you know social relationships and you know his like anti-Putin clout on the internet. And the day after I was let out of solitary confinement, he um, denounced um, the gray zone and being with me, and he lied. And he acted like he didn't know who I was when I had talked to him at length before we met up. Um, he just never thought, I guess it would be public that he was with me. Um, and he, he totally threw me under the bus, even though I was facing, you know, 25 years to life in prison. Um, he, he thought it was more important to make sure that everyone knows he doesn't like Russia. Yeah. So here's from the Andre X who, uh, I think has previously, worked for the U.S. State Department-backed outlet Medusa and now mm -hmm. poses as some kind of edgy anarchist reporter. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of speculation online because I was arrested with a contributor, misspelled contributor, for, for Gray Zone, a pro-Russian publication. I want to make something very clear. I do not support the fascist Russian regime, and I never will. I stand unequivocally against all imperialism. Um, so by sitting next to you in a car, he was implicated as basically supporting Russia by all of his tool colleagues. Mm -hmm. And he sold you out at a time when you were in the hands of violent Israeli prison guards, the same ones who have been raping Palestinian men in torture camps, and you were held in solitary confinement. This guy denounces you as pro-Russian. Uh, lending credence to the sense that you represent some kind of foreign government. Yeah, yeah. A, a I state. Mean, this is the ultimate, yeah. and and it wouldn't be the first time I've witnessed an in intimate fashion uh, treason from a professional leftist poser. But this is uh, another level. Uh, this is shocking. I mean, to have a a journalist sell you out like that when mainstream journalists from PBS, like Nick Schifrin mm -hmm. actually supported your freedom by being helpful with us and the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is as mainstream as you can get, mm -hmm. stood up for you. You have these, like this, this clown throwing he you said, under the bus. 
he said, um, you know, I, I would, I never want to collaborate with anyone who works for a publication that, you know, um, that, that washes and promotes, you know, fascist narratives, whether it be Russian, Iranian, or, um, Israeli, like he, um, he said that. And then I believe just weeks ago, he was with, um, a handful of Haaretz journalists in the West bank. So like, it's, it's strange that like he draws the line for, um, you know, like independent media that's, that is, um, we, we can't be with independent media that supports fascist regimes, but mm. I can be with Haaretz journalists who, you know, every day on the cover, on the front page of the website of Haaretz, there's something, um, you know, they're laundering Netanyahu talking points. They're, they're as mainstream as it gets in Israel. They, they're a Zionist it, publication. Of course. Yeah. And so it's, um, he's picking and choosing. Like I, I can be with Haaretz, even though they support Israel, but I can't be with Gray Zone because sometimes they're critical of the U.S. role in the proxy war in Eastern Europe. It was just like, he's not being consistent. Um, he's not that bright, um, but he's clearly, um, he's, he's clearly ha has no um, moral or ethical standards. He, he threw another journalist under the bus as they were being held by the, you know, the only apartheid state in the world that's currently committing a genocide. And he thought it was more important to make a stand against Putin. Yeah. I mean, usually in times like this, you can judge who your friends are by who speaks up and who, who aren't your friends by who's silent. And certainly there were, there were some noticeably silent people, but you don't expect someone who was actually detained with you, like arrested and beaten mm -hmm. with you to just sell you out like that, just to uh, maintain their uh, state department street credibility. But anyway, uh, you were forced to, you were basically forced to open your phone or they hacked into your phone and your devices. Can you tell us more about the Israelis, the Israeli police and therefore Israeli intelligence had full access to your devices and they were looking for evidence that you were some kind of deep Iranian mm -hmm. spy. So, so what happened there? Well, um, my, every, all my electronics, my laptop, my phone, they were seized, uh, you know, within the, within the first, um, minutes of being, uh, under in their um custody and control like as soon as i walked into the prison they, they took all my stuff they took all my laptops my phone and they asked me to open my phone and i said no because i knew i didn't commit any crimes and i shouldn't be you know um i shouldn't be opening my phone and and you know giving away my my privacy um without actually committing any crimes so i said no um and they had my phone they had my laptop this entire time um they, they clearly didn't, they never brought up in court that they found something, but I yeah. will say there was one occasion where I went in for interrogation and I said, we want to see your conversation. You said that Max Blumenthal sent you, um, the, the PBS news hour video. And we want to see the conversation from October 2nd from Max sending it to you. And we want to click the link and we want to watch it ourselves. I said, I mean, like I knew that I could do. That is exactly what's in my phone. And like, if that will uh, make them see that I'm not a, a criminal or a terrorist or a traitor, like that's, that's perfect because that's all there on my cell phone. So I went to the office, I put in my passcode, I went to my conversation with you and right then and there in the same, in the place that I said it would be is a, is a text from you saying, um, like, you know, look at this PBS news hour report, I click on it. It says, it says media cannot cannot load or media unavailable on Twitter, and I had just watched the video hours before um, before I went there, and I it with me because I I knew that this video is so important and they keep acting like it doesn't exist over and over for hours on end. I bring it up in court, I bring it up in interrogation, and they seem to not care about it or, or don't believe me that it's a real video. I bring <laughs> I bring a paper that has frame by frame of the video with Hebrew translations, and I give it to them, and I'm thinking in my head like. Of course, they've already seen this. I'm just giving to them as a favor. Like, I don't, I, I know they've seen the video. It doesn't matter, but I'm going to give them this paper because now it's, it has Hebrew translation. They don't really speak English. And he looks at the paper as if I gave him, you know, the something top secret and so special. He's never seen this video before. It looks like he's looking at it really closely. He's taking notes. And I'm thinking like, this is a video I brought up to you almost probably a hundred times by now. How is it possible that you guys have not watch this video that I'm talking about and, and bring up in court. It, it, it's the main piece of evidence that I'm pointing to that I got the, this information from. I didn't get it from Iran. 
I got it from PBS and this is the video and they have never seen it. And it seemed to me that the police were censored from seeing this video. Like that could be why they didn't um, believe me because they couldn't find this video. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, a lot of, a yeah. lot of uh, content is censored inside Israel. For example, I did a video years ago <clears throat> um, in which I exposed a Holocaust denier, like a Holocaust revisionist for, uh, you know, I, I, and covered a secret event they did like many years ago. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to watch it in Israel just because it simply deals with the topic of Holocaust revisionism or Holocaust denial. And so on any Wi-Fi network in Israel, you just simply can't watch it. So that might've been what happened with you. But I think it's, it's even more interesting than that. It's the fact that I was at a house in Jerusalem. I was at a cafe in Jerusalem. I'm able to watch the video at these places, but it's particularly on the police Wi-Fi network that it's unavailable. Um, it's, it's almost as if the censors are covering their own ass and yeah. they don't want the police to see videos that put Israel in a bad light because then they'll get reprimanded by their bosses. Like it's, it's almost like it's not um, particularly political. It's like, because it's not actually censored, it's only censored for, you know, politicians and police, but it's not censored for anybody else in Israel. So like, I, yeah. I, maybe that's why they weren't able to see this video. Well, that, you know, makes it, it's very frustrating. Yeah. Uh, but I, it ultimately, what I thought would happen was, this would all go before a judge. They would mm -hmm. see that there was that it was meritless. The police would go through all of your devices mm -hmm. and find nothing connecting you to any, you know, foreign enemy, because you and we have nothing to hide there. Um, and then a, the judge would let would let you go, but that's not what happened. Um, October twentieth, the deadline rolled around, and this was a day after Shabbat. So basically there'd been all these holidays mm -hmm. and nothing had happened. And then all this, all of a sudden, what you're, you're out or what happened? Well, during the, these holidays, um, we were able to send, um, several dossiers of proof that both American media and Israeli media published what I published sometimes in more detail before me. So we sent them, you know, 20 pages of information that um, proves my innocence, essentially. We sent them a, um, a video file of the PBS News report and a few other reports, just in case they were actually censored from seeing them. They can actually click on this video file without the internet. Um, we sent them a few statements of concern and people, um, you know, um, just, um, you know, kind of corroborating the fact that I am a real journalist in America and like, I'm not a spy. So we, we just sent everything to them. It's holidays. We don't know if they're reading it or not. But then Sunday comes around the 20th, the day that I find out if I'm getting rearrested or not. Um, my lawyer gets a call and say, they say, can Mr. Lafredo book a sooner flight? And she says, uh, of course. And I don't have my phone. I don't have my wallet. I don't have anything. So I rush to my lawyer's office and I use a computer at my lawyer's office and I book a flight as soon as I can. And we send the flight number and the confirmation to the police. And they go incommunicado after that. We have not heard from them since. We send them the flight number and my lawyer says, okay, well, we sent it. They asked you to book a flight. Let's give somebody, you know, a power of attorney to pick up your things and see if they give it to them. We don't know if they will, but let's see. So someone goes to pick up my passport, my laptop and my phone, and they do give it to them. So now I have all my belongings and I have a flight that they told me to book. So um, my lawyer reaches out one last time and says, can you give Mr. Lafredo a letter that says he is allowed to leave the country and he's free to go. They don't answer. They, they, no one answers. They're done talking to my lawyer. So I, I go to Ben Gurion Airport. I try to leave the country, and I get you know interrogated there um, twice. And they ask me questions. I show them a letter from my lawyer. Um, I show them like news articles that say the twentieth is the day that Jeremy finds out if he gets rearrested or not. And I'm like, today's the twenty first. So like you know. I'm, I am leaving. I'm, I'm allowed to go. And they, they, they ask me some questions. They go on the Grayson website, their eye, eyebrows raised. <laughs> um, they, they, you know, they, a face of disgust as they're looking through the Grayson website, but they can't actually, they see that the police have already dealt with me in some way or another. They don't want to step on anyone's toes, I think. So they, they let me go and they let me leave the country. And this is something that's been happening more and more in Israel. 
They don't want to go through the bureaucracy of actually charging someone and actually deporting someone. So they've been calling this informal deportation, where they just tell you to book a flight. And if you know what's best for yourself, you're, you'll leave the country. And they, I think they just wanted to get me out of there. And I, I successfully left Israel. Which uh, was a huge relief to us and everyone watching uh, because it's unclear what they're capable of doing, especially mm -hmm. when the police is effectively under the control of security minister Itamar Ben-Gvir, who doesn't even pretend to believe in the rule of law. He just believes the police should advance the supremacist imperatives of th that are at the core of the logic of Zionism, which is what obviously Im helped embolden the cops and jailers that were abusing you in the beginning. So fortunately, you made it out. A lot of people don't realize you get it. You can actually get interrogated on your way out of Israel. <laughs> um, so it was, you know, sort of one final. Mm -hmm. hurdle to clear before leaving the big prison.